Hello and welcome to a Micromaterialism podcast. Today I'm joined by Ramsey Issa, who's going to help us describe a totally new field, and that is the field of bioprinting. Ramsey, tell us about yourself a little bit. Uh, hey, Taylor, thanks for having me. Uh, so, my name is Ramsey Issa. Um, I graduated from UC Santa Barbara with a degree in chemistry. Um, I worked in the material science and engineering lab under Professor Shashadri for about three and a half years. It was an absolutely amazing experience. Great mentor. Uh, I think, Taylor, you even yeah, did your dude, postdoc? He was, yep, I did my postdoc with Ram, and he's an amazing guy, and it's an amazing culture that they have in that place. So, love to work with you. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and dive into uh, a bit about what bioprinting is about. Wait, before you do that, I saw this in your notes that you were a professional skateboarder at some point. You got to tell me more about that. What's this? So um, I was actually sponsored growing up. Uh, my little brother, who uh, Rami Issa, he's a software engineer now. Um, he was uh, on the professional level, but I was uh, uh, an, an amateur. So they would send us like boxes and boxes of like skateboards, shoes, clothes. I was sponsored by like uh, America crew clothing. So it was, it was an amazing experience. And then me and him decided to go back to school. He's actually coming out in the next Thrasher uh, magazine this, um, this month. So no check way. That out. Yeah, Dude, that's awesome. I love to see the, the not what people think when they think of dusty old scientists is a, right. a pro-am skateboarder. So very, very cool. Anyway, with that said, tell me what on earth is bioprinting, just so people understand what we're talking about. Yeah, so this is actually a very fascinating, cool topic. Um, bioprinting is basically any technique that allows you to uh, transfer biological or biologically active materials onto a substrate that typically leads to a 3D uh, constructed scaffold uh, that can mimic uh, tissue or organ functionality. Okay. So as soon as you describe that, my mind immediately goes to Hollywood. I've seen like a million and one movies where they're, you know, they're set in the future, typically dystopian sci-fi. You're thinking like altered carbon, or you're thinking these different movies where they're, they're printing human bodies, you know, ghost in the shell where the shell is the body that can be modified. Is that what we're talking about here? And is this a reality that I just didn't know about, or is this far out in the field still? It's, uh, it's, it's happening now. There's definitely some, um, some more uh, progress to come, but uh, they've implanted things like bladder, bl fully functional bladders into people. Um, they started to print out uh, liver tissue, which wow. is uh, a very complex organ. Uh, the architecture of the liver uh, is, is, is very complex. So it's, it's still, it takes some time to get there, but I think with, within a few years, they'll definitely be able to do it. That is unreal. Yeah. Very, very cool. So, all right, then why, why do we bother doing this? Other than the fact that it's cool, like why do we need to do this? Obviously there's organ shortages, I would imagine. I know that there's kidney waiting lists, heart transplant waiting lists. Um, why are we doing this? Yeah, so uh, there's a huge uh, necessity for uh, organs that we don't have now. So you have about 114,000 people on the organ transplant list waiting for organs. And actually many of them die waiting for uh, these organs. They don't get uh, uh, an or organ donor in time uh, to donate that crucial organ. So you die of like a disease, uh, a diseased uh, organ, right? So gotcha. you could tackle problems like that. There's also uh, uh, pharmaceutical testing that uh, bioprinting will tackle. Things like uh, we no longer have to test um, these new pharmaceutical drugs on animals. We could test them on bioprinted human organs. We'll actually yield oh, better results. Cool. cool. And yeah. you don't have the ethical challenge of, you know, you had to, you know, kill some creature to make this happen. Exactly. Did, that's very cool. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So how on earth does this work? I'm picturing in my brain like a 3D printer, but I'm guessing it's not the same thing. So tell me about it. Uh, pretty pretty close, right? So they start off with uh, an MRI or a CT scan of the organ of interest. They then use um, like a th uh, a 3D uh, CAD-like software to develop the scaffold. And your scaffold is basically your structure that you're you're building out. So if you want like a, a, a airway for um, uh, for your body, you would uh, essentially design a 3D structure of that in CAD, right? Um, so then we have uh, different printing methods that we could choose from. There's laser-induced uh, laser 
printing, there's uh, thermal inkjet printing, uh, extrusion. So uh, extrusion is actually the most common printing method. Really? And yeah, it uses a um, what's called a bio ink, which is basically a uh, hydrogel that uh, kind of like toaster strudel, when you squeeze out that icing, it, uh, it comes out and you build that 3D structure. So you can kind of think about it like that. It's like a syringe that deposits or deposits this uh, hydrogel and builds out a 3D structure. You take this 3D uh, structure, which is your scaffold, you could uh, incubate it and you coat, you coat the scaffold with um, the cells of interest and you give it like the same physiological conditions that the body experiences. So like 37C, uh, 95% uh, oxygen. And within weeks, you'll have a transplantable organ that you could go ahead and put into a body, which is amazing. So this is super cool. You keep mentioning like this scaffolding and then you put the tissue around it, the cells around it. So how does, that's gotta be different than what your body does, right? I can't imagine that all of our organs have a scaffold inside of them. So does the scaffold dissolve over time and go away or is this just like fundamentally a little bit different, but it functions the same way? So the scaffold acts as uh, a structure that these cells can essentially proliferate on. So they'll just, uh, the scaffold acts as the structure that the cells can make all these connections uh, on in the incubator and um, essentially mold into that organ. So yeah, I guess you would need a uh, biocompatible uh, polymers that essentially would dissolve out and the cells will make these connections and form that that structure. Okay, but in the end that stru that scaffold's going to stay with the organ that gets implanted. I believe in some cases yes. Uh I think it depends on on the organ or tissue that they're targeting. There might okay. be some some uh some techniques where the uh the scaffold will actually dissolve out because they use things like collagen as well, which collagen, uh, I think is. It's all over in your body anyways. Yeah. It'll just, uh, kind of dissolve out into the body. Cool. So I didn't know this field existed. Um, and yet today, if you need a kidney, it's not like you're going and getting one of these printed kidneys. At least I don't think we are yet. Um, that must mean that there are still challenges that we're facing. Can you tell me about some of the issues that the field is still struggling with? Yeah, good, uh, good question. So some of the, the um, issues we face are when it comes to printing these complex uh, organs like, say, a liver or a kidney, uh, they've been shown to lack uh, functioning blood vessels. And blood vessels typically bring uh, your nutrients and oxygen to the uh, organ for it to function properly. So if the blood vessels aren't working, then uh, the liver essentially is, is not functional. Uh, there's other, um, there's other problems like cell damage during the print process. The heat of the printing, printing process renders, uh, the scaffold, uh, basically insufficient because once you print it out and the cells, uh, in the scaffold aren't, are damaged, you can't build those, uh, connections. The cells can't, uh, connect and form, uh, or turn that scaffold into an organ. Gotcha. Yeah, we also face uh, problems like biomaterials. We're limited to um, very few biosynthetic materials or bio inks uh, that are naturally occurring. Okay, and you said they typically use hydrogels or are there other things that they're using? Typically hydrogels, they, they do, there's different processes that, uh, that they use. There's a more expensive process where they uh, use they compact a bunch of uh, patient cells uh, into like pellets and print out directly the cells. So that's a very, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Much so, more expensive process. Because before you described it, they would put a scaffold and once that was in place, they would sort of infuse it with the cells. And I don't know how that, what's that process look like. Do they just wash them over it and allow them to grow or what do they do? Great question. Great question. So there's, there's actually two ways they can do it. They could infuse the cells with the hydrogel to make okay. the bio ink, which is basically the bio ink is just like you, when you have a regular printer, you need ink, you need bio ink for a bio printer and it's made up of hydrogels. Um, so this hydrogel, they could infuse the cells 
with the uh, hydrogel to make that quote unquote bio ink and print it out directly and then incubate it. Or they could just print out the hydrogel itself without infusing the cells gotcha. into it. And then they would just put this scaffold into a, um, into a cell bath and coat the scaffold with your cells in the incubator. Allow so there's, go. yeah. Dude, this is bonkers. I, we need to do a full episode on this, I think, because there's I'm getting like a million questions of what you could do with this. So it's incredible. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've, you've read a bunch about this and studied it and getting ready for this episode. What do you think is the future of bioprinting? What's, uh, what's right on the horizon for us? Man, uh, I think the future for bioprinting or the main goal that they seek to, uh, to achieve is to create like a 3D vascularized organ that functions properly and you could you know go to your surgeon and you know if your organs diseased the surgeon could take a sample swab of your tissue or the organ they want send it to this bioprinting lab and within about a few weeks they send you know this organ in a sterile container ready for implant uh, you know in, in implantation so there's things like that um, there's also the, the whole pharmaceutical testing you could even now I mean if, if you really think about it you could start making drugs that are um that are targeted for a person's uh physiology right so like my body might react different yep. than than your body to a, a certain medication right so if i could take a sample of my uh, uh cells and build out an organ and test those drugs uh on my organ i'll know exactly how oh, how that's that so drug cool. reacts yeah, that, insane, that idea yeah. is so rad to me. I saw a guy from uh, UC San Francisco give a talk on personalized medicines a while back that just blew my mind. Like, instead of just getting like average responses that work for your average person pretty well, you can find that exact drug that works the best for you and get way better outcomes. And you're describing a way where we can test that without putting it in my body in case it harms me. Like, so, yeah. so cool. All right, man. Well, um, anything else? Anything awesome you learned about that you want to leave us with? A pretty cool thing that I have in the background actually is an artery uh, that was printed by uh, a team at Carnegie Mellon. They uh, printed this soft tissue uh, into a gelatin uh, or yeah, gelatin slurry so that the scaffold holds because the the scaffold it's material. Such a soft tissue, right? Exactly. Yeah. Spot on. Yep. So it needs to, something to sort of cup it in place while it's being printed. Oh, this looks like something right out of sci-fi. This looks like altered <laughs> carbon to me. This is so cool. Yeah. All right. Well, Ramsey, thanks for sharing some knowledge with us, man. We look forward to doing probably a deep dive on this subject for a full episode later. Sweet. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Absolutely. Appreciate we'll it. talk to you later, man. So before we go, special thanks to our sponsors. The first one is MatMatch. If you haven't used MatMatch before, I highly suggest you check this software out. I wish I would have known about this when I was an undergrad myself. It's a way for you to go and you can plug in the exact properties you want. You want strength above a certain value, thermal expansion below a certain value. You need it to be, you know, whatever type of elements. You can select this and it will pull up not only the materials that are available, but where you can buy them, the providers that will sell them to you. You can find the spec sheets for them. This is just a, a, an incredible resource. And what's awesome is that it's totally free to use. So check out matmatch.com. See for yourself how valuable this is. We also would like to thank Materials Today. Materials Today uh, through Elsevier uh, Publisher is a sponsor of the Materialism Podcast. So check them out. Go to materialstoday.com or elsevier.com to learn more about their journals, books, conferences, and their other related programs. And finally, special thanks to Alphabot and Colobite who make the awesome music for this podcast. See you guys next time.